Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you have been here already, or if you are new here and you are enjoying what you are hearing, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and make sure to turn your notifications to all so you will be reminded of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Stalker Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. So I was a kid, maybe six or seven. This was in the mid nineties. We took a family trip to the beach in Florida. We were staying in a beach house, a short walking distance away from the beach. We went to the beach and I was supposed to stay inside of my mom, but I wandered way down and before I knew it, I was lost. A lot of the houses looked the same and I wasn't sure which one was ours. Plus, I couldn't see my mom anywhere. It started to rain. I came to a path that I was pretty sure led back to our house. Only, it didn't lead back to a house at all, but instead to a parking lot. There was a big, dirty van parked there. It was the only vehicle around. I was about to turn back around when I noticed an overweight woman with brown hair and a hot pink tank top and these big, clunky, thick glasses that were popular in the 80s, waving and smiling at me from the passenger seat of the van. She said something like, Oh my, it's raining. Where's your mommy? Let us take you back to her. It's dangerous to be out here in the rain. You could be struck by lightning. She was very friendly, almost overly so. In the driver's seat was a very overweight man without a shirt on, a hairy gray chest and some clunky looking gold chain. He was wearing yellow tinted Elvis shades and staring at me intently. He was also smoking a cigarette, which I knew was bad. The woman stepped out of the van and kneeled down to me. She asked how old I was. When I told her, she gleefully remarked, Oh my, we have two boys your age at our house. You could come over and spend the night. We've got movies, Nintendo, and in the morning, we've got all types of cereal. I had been taught all about stranger danger. But at this point in my life, no adult had ever given me any reason not to trust them. This lady continued talking about stuff like how the boys have go-karts and they like to drink chocolate milk. She made it seem very enticing for a seven-year-old kid. And at this point, I trusted her. I mostly liked the idea of getting to play with some kids my age. Then I remembered that I needed to ask my mom first. I told her this. She told me that was no problem, that they lived just up the road. My mom shouldn't mind. It started raining harder, and she opened the sliding door of the van. It said something like, Now let's get you out of this rain and go find your mommy. I knew logically that I shouldn't do this, but the lady seemed really nice, and I was desperately wanting to get out of the rain. As I walked toward the open door of the van, I noticed an awful stench that almost made me gag. This set off alarm bells in my head that something wasn't right. There were cigarette butts all over the floor. I looked up at the fat man who was not only staring at me with his menacing glare, but he had this real creepy toothy smile and his teeth were stained a dark yellow. I could pick up on every fucked up vibe from him. I knew now that I should run, but the woman was ushering me to hurry up and get in. Her demeanor had changed. She was being demanding and trying to literally push me into the van. She sounded angry and said, get in already, in a tone that was the complete opposite of how she had just sounded before. 
I jumped to the side and started running as fast as I could. The woman managed to grab my arm or wrist, but somehow I was able to quickly break free and run back to the beach. I think she tried to chase me, but like I said, she was very overweight. I made it back to my mom, who was freaking out. I tried explaining what had happened to me, but I don't think that at seven years old, I was able to convey the gravity of what had happened to me. And I didn't fully understand myself. After almost being kidnapped, we learned that this couple stalked everyone on the beachfront. Hello, for the record, I'm a female. I'm turning 19 this year, and this story happened when I was 15. Oh, and also, I'm from France, so please excuse any grammatical English errors. When I was 15 years old and just got into junior year, I created my first Twitter account. That I deleted because of this story. Some information. I didn't tell anyone my username neither my family nor my friends because I didn't have any. My profile picture was an avatar, so no pictures of me on the account and as location, I said Paris because I lived in the suburbs. I didn't have many followers, 20 or maybe 30, and I didn't follow that many people, so my Twitter page was not really interesting. One evening in October, someone sent me a quite strange direct message it was a 200 followers account, and the message was, Hi, my name is Bob. I just turned 17 and wanted to know if you lived in Redacted, because I will soon move in and go to the town high school, and I'm looking for friends. Redacted was absolutely the town I lived in. I immediately thought something was wrong because there was nowhere on my profile I said where I actually lived. But after some time thinking, I remembered of a tweet I made weeks ago about buses, and I mentioned the city. So I told myself he just looked up for Redacted and found my tweet. His age wasn't shocking because I'm two years ahead of my classmates. I was bored, and as he was polite, I answered him. I told him I indeed lived in Redacted and go to high school there. The discussion was natural, and we talked a lot that night. Mainly about high school, about the food at the cafeteria, about the teachers, you know, that kind of thing. But as it was getting very late, he tried to interpose some personal question, like, do you live far away from the school? In a house or an apartment? Do you live with both your parents? There's five of you? You're not often home alone, right? I never answered because it was way too shady for me. And unfortunately, he didn't insist. Unfortunately, because if he did, I would have probably blocked him. The next day, same thing. We talked a lot, and he was still asking personal questions to know me better. So I asked them too. He always answered with what seemed like honesty. I still didn't answer the question about my house, though, because he didn't need to know that information. It lasted two or three weeks, but it was enough for me to develop feelings for him. He was handsome, super kind, and it was everything I needed because I was bullied for years. And even today, I still develop strong feelings, but most importantly, build trust in people who are friendly to me. In France, in October, we have a two weeks long vacation, and the day before back to school day, he finally told me he was coming to my high school because he finally moved in with his mom, and he asked me a place to meet him during the morning break. I was so happy and relieved to be able to meet him and told him to join me in the hall. But when he understood that there would be people around, he said he would prefer an isolated place because he was afraid he would not recognize me and didn't want to spend the break looking for me. It was a good excuse for me, so I told him to meet me in the third floor bathroom because we weren't allowed to stay there during the breaks. 
and no one would disturb us anyway. In my head, even though it was a little bit creepy, I still was in the school, so nothing could happen to me. Next day, back to school day, I made myself pretty. I wore my best clothes, I counted down the minutes, and finally, when break time arrived, I ran to the bathroom and waited. And when he arrived, it was him. He was not a catfish. He looked quite like his profile picture, but I still noticed that he seemed a little bit older than he told me. I thought 20 years old instead of 17. We talked a lot. We got along well. I was so pleased. And at the end of the break, he asked me to go to the fast food with him for lunch. I said no because I didn't have any money, and I always refuse for people to pay for me. It's a principle. He seemed disappointed, but offered me to walk me home after class. I explained I had to take the bus, but that he could walk me to the bus stop. He looked disappointed again, but finally accepted it. And that's exactly what happened, and it was so great that it quickly became some kind of routine. He met in the third floor bathroom during the morning break, and he walked me to the bus stop after classes. Surprising fact, I never saw him in the hallways nor at the cafeteria, but I thought at that time that the building was huge and there was over 1,500 students in here. So if our schedules didn't coincide, there was no way we could meet each other. This little game lasted until December, so almost a month and a half. The 14th of December, a Thursday, I complained about how lonely I was going to be that evening because my dad was abroad for work. My brother was always at his friend's house. My little sister was on a school trip and my mom had to work late that very night. It was a very reckless thing of me, but after weeks, I thought I could trust him. That evening, he walked me to the bus stop. We both waited. I got in the bus, waved at him, and put on my earphones. I had two stops before my house. It was about 1745 hours in December, so it was already really dark outside. And as I got out of the bus, I had a really bad feeling. There was that very uncomfortable sensation in my stomach, and I felt like I'm being observed. I pressed pause on my music, but kept my earphones on so that people thought I couldn't hear anything. And that's probably what saved my life. I lived in a suburban neighborhood, very silent, especially at night, with no visibility on the big road the bus passed in. When I heard footsteps behind me, I understood I was right. There was someone following me, and he was not well intended. At least I could hear that he was not accelerating, so he was not trying to catch me at all. But I couldn't guess how long it would last. As quietly as possible, I tried to reach for my keys in my pocket, and when I finally pulled them out, I ran as fast as I could. The best sprint of my life. I didn't know how it worked, but I managed to open and to close the door before he could reach me. I then deactivated my alarm, which, by the way, confirmed that I was home alone and took a look through the glass panel on the door. It is not a peephole. It is a whole window. So if someone wanted to see what's happening inside, they could. It was Rob. A few meters away, looking at me with a really creepy face. He followed me to my home, probably with a car, and he was clearly not here for chit-chat. I still don't know why I didn't call the police. I was totally paralyzed. We both stared at each other for a minute, and when I took back control over my body, I ran to the kitchen to get a knife and got back to the door. He was there, too banging against the door. I feared for a second that the glass would break, but it didn't happen. That moment when I was pushing against the door, praying for it not to break while he was kicking harder and harder, was the longest I've ever experienced. After maybe five minutes, he stopped and got around the house, knocking against every shutter, and 
got back to the door. He looked very angry, but then my neighbor's car reached my house and Rob ran away, probably thinking it was my mom coming home. On Twitter, Rob sent me a thousand messages before I could block him. He then deleted his account and I thought I was done with this story. But quickly after, some accounts which have been created followed me. Their at were all a series of numbers and the first letter of his name. And as soon as I blocked one, another one followed me. I chose to delete my account because I couldn't make it stop. And it was too hard to endure because they were sending me dozens of insulting DMs. Later, I talked to the people who were supposed to be Rob's classmates because I haven't met him again in days, but not a single one of them have ever heard about Rob. This guy was never a student in my high school. This is why I never met him apart from our daily meetings, and that is probably why he seems so old. I never heard about him anymore, and I'm still asking myself, what did he want and what could have happened that night? So, to Rob, I really hope you stop stalking me and that we never, ever meet again. A recent entry got me thinking about my own situation. When I was 13, my mom, my young brother, and I were living with mom's parents. We had escaped my mom's seriously abusive, psychopathic husband. And while living with my grandparents wasn't ideal, we needed a safe place for my mom to physically recover. My grandmother had tailors and sheds on the property that she would rent out to people who needed a cheap place to live in, but had no other options, such as undocumented workers or people with criminal records. Most of them were pretty nice and just kept to themselves. And then there was Steve. Steve started asking my mom out. She was straight with him and told him no. She was still dealing with her husband's threats and had no interest in dating for the next several years. But he kept asking, then begging, then arguing. He would not take no for an answer. He started following her around. We'd be at the bus stop, and Steve would be watching us from across the street. We'd be getting dinner, and he'd be sitting outside the diner, watching us through the window. I'd even see him following me to and from school. We stopped letting my brother walk to his school alone because Steve would follow him, too. He was always around. Then he started whispering outside of our bedroom windows at night. Every night... For hours, the three of us would sit huddled in the dark, listening to Steve ranting and raving, begging, shouting, threatening. He would call my mom his angel, his soulmate, a whore, a tease, a demon, and all kinds of other shit. While trying to peer through the blinds, he was escalating. But why didn't you call the police? You were asking yourself. Simple. Grandma made it very clear that Steve was a paying tenant and much more valuable than her own stupid, useless daughter. If mom cost her money, she'd throw us back out on the street, which would cost her custody of my brother, and my brother would not survive his father on his own. So we were trapped. One night, during his ranting, Steve had an epiphany. Of course, my mom loved him, too. Of course, she wanted to be with him. The only thing keeping them apart were her children. They could be together once my brother and I disappeared. I can still remember how calm and sympathetic he sounded when he assured her that he'd take care of everything. And they could be together forever. She didn't have to worry about us anymore. He'd handle getting rid of us. The next morning, Mom contacted my stepdad to ask him how to defend us physically. My stepdad, knowing my mom literally couldn't defend herself against an irritated cat, 
convinced my mom to tell him the problem. He told her to go home and not to worry about it. He talked to Steve. I don't know what my stepdad said to Steve. I don't know what he did. But Steve was gone before I got home from school that day. He had only taken what he could carry and disappeared. So, Steve, you made an already bad situation terrifying. My brother and I aren't children anymore, so for your sake, we better not run into you. Warning, this recount contains some references to self-harm and violence. So this happened a few years ago in high school. I was slim and pretty tall. The fight is in the spirit, not the muscle in my case. Could probably be absolutely flatlined in a fight, but we'll never admit that fully. One day at lunchtime, a random student, weird beard, came up to me and sat down without saying much. I, being a bit of a loner, was open to the company and listened to him talk about his life. He was a massive dude, a head taller and twice as broad, a bit necky, beardy. He spoke in a really flat, monotone voice with zero inflection. In our very first conversation, he talked about how he never slept, and I offered some tips, also finding it hard to sleep. He kind of brushed it off like he didn't actually want to solve anything or talk about it fully. He instantly moved on to the topic of self-harm and brandished his forearms, covered in some thin cuts. He pulled out a razor and was sort of like, yeah, that's my buddy here, waving the razor around. I take self-harm seriously and was genuinely concerned for this guy. I asked him if he had anyone to talk to about it, and from memory, his response was sort of like, Sykes are useless. They don't know shit. I don't have anyone to talk to. Who cares? So I felt awful for him and would check up on him every now and again, although I barely had to try because he'd always find me somehow and walk alongside me or creep up behind me. This whole thing was a slow burn and took a long time to escalate. But, alas, a lack let us continue into stage two. So we hung out a few times. He found where I was sitting at lunch, and he asked for my number. I thought, oh well, what's the worst that could happen? He started messaging me a lot. It started pretty general, but then he messaged me that he liked me. I scrunched up my nose and sent the sorry not interested message that made me feel like a dick. But clearly, unfazed, he continued asking and would say things like, I dreamt about you last night. I dreamt we had sex, etc. I often said, I'm just not looking for a relationship. But eventually I said, you're not my type which caused him to ask, why though, what's your type? He suggested we go shopping together for me to choose clothing I'd like on him and a haircut I'd like for him to have, as if that would magically make him my type. Random, but I noticed him getting a bit experimental with his hair and shaving in some really cringe-looking lightning bolt. I thought he expected me to jump all over him with his face's new acquisition. He said he knew I'd be happy with him if I just accepted his appearance, as if that was the problem. He started bringing up the self-harm again and again, saying he just felt if we were in a relationship that he'd be able to cope with his depression better. He would lash out and call me a bitch for not wanting him to be happy and would 180 from those angry rages to over-the-top apologies and the classic, are we good now? At school, he passed me a razor blade and said, keep this. I think he'd used it on himself and couldn't tell what he was implying, perhaps for me to do the same. It was a sort of, 
in case you need it. Gesture. In my off classes, I would study in the library, and he started to figure that out. He would walk up and just drool. Hey. I eventually stopped looking up. Then he'd start kicking my leg until I did. Even when I said I was busy, he'd say, Geez, can I at least just sit here? I'd sort of shrug, and he'd take that as a hell yeah. Once he came with me to the shops, and we almost got kicked out because the shop security saw him and didn't trust me by association. Weirdbeard laughed later on and said all the police knew him by name, as if this was something to be proud of. He tried to walk me home a few times, and I would keep telling him, no, I'm fine. He didn't take no for an answer and walked me all the way to my house, even though I repeatedly asked, don't you have anywhere else to go? As a way of softly rejecting him. I went on holidays at some point and used it as a chance to tell him, I'm going out of reception and can't talk. Because whenever I usually told him I was busy, he'd just say, Stop ignoring me, bitch. What the fuck is your problem? That sort of thing. I thought, my God, surely he'll accept this reason. I run into a patch of reception after one day away. 22 missed calls. No more needs to be said there. Just wow. All righty. Now, here's when things ramp up in the creepy factor. Let's call this stage three. He follows me out of class one day and asks where I'm going. I say I'm heading out for a walk around the town. He walks after me and I say, oh, aren't you busy now? He says, nah and keeps walking. We're all alone at the back of the school, and part of me felt too scared and too tired to turn this giant man away. He talked about erratic fits of anger, and out of nowhere, he punched a fence because his knuckles, oh God, he punched a fence, causing his knuckles to bleed. I was like, whoa, man, um... Maybe you should go do something about that. He laughed and said, <laughs> I do all this all the time, don't worry. Sometimes I just have to punch things. I laughed it off and kept walking. We walked past a family walking their dog and Weird Beard stiffens next to me, just stops walking. Then he says just after the family passes, I killed a dog once. It was running along without its owner. Stupid owner let it off the leash. It jumped up on me, and I stamped his spine in half. Pause in the middle of the story. I deeply apologize to all the fur baby owners. This is just in the story I'm reading. I apologize if this upsets you. Okay, back to our story. Internally, I was shocked and didn't know what to say feeling increasingly uncomfortable. Externally, I did the whole, <laughs> yeah, right, not wanting to show this dude I was scared or concerned in any way. He didn't laugh and just looked at me dead in the eye. I fucking hate dogs. Then he tells me about how he likes to kill animals when he's angry to help him relieve the anger and that it's the safest way to contain himself. I assume this means instead of hurting people. He said he'd use a stick sometimes to mix things up. I was completely alone with Weird Beard at this point, and I turned around, deciding the walk was over. After that, I try avoiding him as much as possible. I get angry messages saying, I know what you're doing, you bitch. No more excuses. Stop ignoring me. And the whole at least have sex with me. Just give it a chance. I would never hurt you. On my birthday, he hand makes something quite big. I say I can't accept it, and he says, I'll teach you how to use it after class. When I still refuse, he dumps it at my feet and walks off. And now we have the finale. I messaged him that I wanted to end our friendship and that I was tired of him asking me out. 
We arranged a place to meet at school, and he met me there, alone. I felt like that wasn't a great idea, but people were starting to spread the word that him and I were together, and I just hated being seen with him on my shoulder, especially at school. I meet him, and he looks ready to pounce or something. The tension was tangible. I tell him that I'm unsure about remaining friends, and he gets upset. I'm a good guy. How can you not see that? I treat you so well. I dream about you all the time. At least let me fuck you. At least give me that. He starts shaking. I deserve this. You're the only person I could ever want to fuck. If I can't have you, I don't want to be here. He starts talking about killing himself and saying, So that's it? You just want to stand here and watch me die? He's shaking a lot, and I'm not sure what is going on. I tell him I'm dating someone else anyway, and he starts crying very angrily. He talks about how he's been abused and how I'm emotionally abusing him and how he loves me, but I could be such a dick. This goes on for hours. Then he gets quiet and just gives me this death stare. I back away and say, I have to go. Please don't do anything stupid to yourself. And I turn and left. He sends me text messages later saying, I wasn't going to do anything to myself. You're lucky, actually. I was seconds away from hurting you. I could have snapped your bones. That sort of stuff. Then he calls me, breathing into the phone, finally saying that he's slit his own throat and starts shouting at me. How am I going to explain this to my parents, huh? Look what you made me do. I'm all covered in blood. He sends me multiple messages threatening to ruin my life and make me go through hell as well as threatening to kill himself and that I'd have to live with practically murdering him. Side note, until this point, I'd only talked with one other person about this guy and she didn't seem worried and brushed the topic off so I hadn't brought it up with the parents. This is when I decide it's time to talk to my parents. We contacted the school, and we considered contacting the police or some sort of emergency service that night because he kept messaging me about the horrible things he was apparently doing to himself. I told my parents I thought he might be bluffing because he's done this sort of thing before. He just hadn't ever threatened my safety before, as he was starting to do now. Sure enough, his neck was fine, his arms were fine, he was perfectly fine the following days. He hadn't done anything to himself, and I was glad that he was okay, but angry to fully realize what a manipulative asshole he truly was. The closing chapter of this whole ordeal was him sending me more messages threatening to ruin my life. He walked up behind me and spat on me, just whispering, bitch, into my ear. I blocked him on my phone. He messaged me ages later on Facebook, which we'd never talked on, to apologize for everything and say he'd changed so much. I said I was happy for him, but, but then he'd still kind of asked or for me to give him another chance to see how good and successful he was now. His massive paragraph was half a humble brag and half a plead. I said yeah, no, and blocked him on every single platform. And here are the final notes. I gave this guy the benefit of the doubt a lot of the time. Even in retrospect, I could never fully tell when he was bluffing about things or not such as the violence against animals. He went into a lot of detail, but at the time, I saw it as more of a violent fantasy of his, 50-50 chance. I felt a lot of guilt around rejecting him. He 
had a really messed up life and told me every single detail of it, so even though I never thought his actions were justified, it still made sense in some way that he'd have strange coping mechanisms and issues. My parents were really good about everything. Once they found out what was going on, they made sure I wasn't walking home alone at all, and we talked to the school about giving this dude extra psychological support with the school counselors, although I'm sure he needed more than that. It also took a long time for me to realize his coincidental appearances, wherever I was, could be considered a form of stalking. Thank you to everyone who listened to my entire story, and I'm happy to say I've never met this guy again. I hope Weird Beard is sorting out his issues, and I hope he hasn't tried to manipulate other girls. I recently started a new job that I absolutely love. I'm a daytime caretaker for an older special needs gentleman. Basically, I pick him up in the mornings and proceed to take him wherever he needs or wants to go during the day. He likes to keep a daily schedule, and that schedule includes us going to the mall every weekday morning at 10 a.m. for at least three hours so that he can walk his laps and socialize with the vendors and the other mall patrons. I've been at this job just under a month, and within the past week and a half, I've had some increasingly creepy encounters with one specific custodian that works at the mall. I'm not required to stay with my client while we're at the mall, seeing as he is still very independent and capable of doing everything on his own. So, last week, Wednesday or Thursday, I believe, I was walking around trying to kill time while he walked his laps and got his exercise in. I happened to walk past a custodian who smiled and waved at me. I returned the gesture, just as I would have with anyone who went out of their way to greet me politely. Little did I know, he was apparently going to take this as an invitation. The next day, I ran into the same custodian. I'm not sure if he just happened to be walking in the same direction and I didn't notice him at first, which seems more and more unlikely as time goes on, or if he just saw me and intentionally started walking in the same direction as I was going. Either way, he began matching pace with me and asked me, how my day had been so far. I replied with a fine thanks and tried to keep on my way. He made a couple of other comments about it being a nice day while staring directly at me long enough for it to get weird and smiling this gigantic smile. He eventually said goodbye to me and turned down a service hallway. After that, I had a few days off of work. I didn't go to the mall during those days, and so the slightly strange custodian didn't cross my mind again until this past Tuesday when I went back to work. I picked my client up in the morning, and we drove to the mall as usual. He approached me again while I was walking and kept making comments about how pretty I am and how he just had to come over and make these dimples pop out. I ignored him, save for an uncomfortable laugh that I couldn't hold back. He just continued and kept calling me beautiful and a real cutie pie. By the time he decided to carry on with his own business, I was thoroughly creeped out. Fast forward to yesterday. It was basically just a bunch of the same weird compliments, but this time he was also adamant about asking me a bunch of questions like, why I've been at the mall so much lately and what I like to do while I'm there, which I didn't give him any answers to. Eventually, he went away again. Then, today. Today had to be the most creeped out he's ever made me feel. 
I was walking past the food court when he found me yet again. This time, I saw him staring at me from afar. When he saw that I could see him, he made an effort to walk past me and say hello, which I promptly ignored and tried to hurry to the other, more out of the way, side of the mall where I meet my client when he's ready to go home, and to hopefully avoid any more contact with this creepy custodian dude for the day. Of course, it didn't work. When I got to the seating area where I wait for my client, he was surprisingly already there. He told me that he wanted to sit for a while before we left. So I sat in the armchair next to him and we talked for a while. Now, keep in mind that this isn't even 20 minutes after my first encounter of the day with the custodian. I look up and guess who's walking straight towards me with that same huge smile and stare. You got it, the custodian. Of course, this time, he positioned himself right in front of the chair I was sitting in, which made me super uncomfortable because I couldn't get up and walk away like I had every other time. I bumped into him. He stood there staring and smiling and said something that made my hair stand on end. You need to stop moving around so much. I didn't respond and didn't look at him. I just wanted him to go away. He tried asking me more questions about why I was there at the mall so often and where I worked and even if I lived around the mall. I didn't give him any answers and just said I needed to leave. He moved, but not before saying again how cute I am and that he'd see me tomorrow. Needless to say, I am thoroughly creeped out. I'd like to go to mall security, but I don't know the man's name, as the custodians don't wear name tags. And even if I were able to describe him well enough for them to figure out who I'm talking about, I have no idea what action they would even be able to take. I'm trying to take every precaution I can, and I've told friends about what's happening, but beyond that, I'm at a loss. I can't change my client's schedule, so I do have to be at the mall every morning at a predictable time, which I'm sure is only making it easier for this guy to find me if he wants to. If anyone has gone through anything similar, I'd love to hear how you resolved it, or at least what your experience was. If anything else happens, I'll update accordingly. Until then, creepy custodian dude, I really hope we don't meet again. Huge update. Ever since I ran into this custodian guy, I've not seen him again. This may be because I've been spending more time inside stores like Starbucks or Barnes & Noble, where I can sit and not be bothered, as opposed to sitting out in the open at any of the seating areas in the middle of the mall or the food court. Whatever the reason, I've been able to relax and enjoy that time that I had to be at the mall instead of being on edge and looking out for any creepy janitors who want to harass me. With that being said, I hope you all stay safe out there and keep your eyes peeled for those creepy custodians. In the summer of 2015, I worked at a university in a small southern town. I lived a few miles away from campus in a two-bedroom house with a roommate and my schedule was pretty rigid. Same routine every day. I went to class in the morning, work in the afternoon, and got home at around 9 p.m. One Thursday night, I arrived home at the usual time and noticed that there was an old pickup truck idling at the yield sign across the street from my house. I didn't know the make or model, but it was pretty beat up, peeling paint, rust, dents, it looked really out of place in our neighborhood. Most people there drove really nice modern cars, so this thing stood out like a sore thumb. 
The streets were deserted. It clearly wasn't waiting for other cars to pass. I thought maybe the driver was just texting or something, but since my roommate wasn't home yet, I didn't want to leave the safety of my own vehicle. I'm a petite woman who doesn't carry pepper spray anymore, so I tried to be aware of my surroundings. I pulled into my driveway and just sat there, staring at the truck and waiting for him to leave. Eventually, it did. It pulled away slowly and made its way out of the neighborhood toward the main road. When it was out of sight, I went inside, locked the door behind me, and made myself some dinner. By 11 p.m., my roommate still hadn't come home, and I was folding laundry and listening to podcasts in my bedroom. I'd forgotten all about the truck. Suddenly, the lights went out. That spooked me, because normally our power didn't shut off unless there was bad weather. That night was clear as a bell, so I immediately called my roommate and asked where he was. He told me he was already on his way home and would be there in about five minutes. Relieved, I just told him to step on it and hung up. No reason to freak out about a power outage, right? He'd be there soon enough and then we could figure it out together. I walked into the living room to wait for him. Our front door had a little diamond-shaped window in it, which I always hated. I stood on my tiptoes and looked out to see if our neighbor's power was out as well. I was surprised to see that it wasn't. Even the streetlight near my front yard was still on. How weird. Had I somehow blown a fuse, maybe? Just as I considered making a trip to the basement to reset the breakers, I received a text message from my mom. I don't remember what it was about, but it only took me a few seconds to answer it. After I did, I looked out the window again. To my utter shock and surprise, there was a man standing under the streetlight. He hadn't been there before, and I instantly got a bad feeling. He was middle-aged and about six feet tall, with a pot belly and little round glasses, unkept hair, old sneakers. His white t-shirt and blue jeans were filthy. He looked like he'd been working on a car or something. He was a mechanic dirty, you know? And he had this awful, smug expression on his face. I had never seen him before. Still in shock at actually seeing someone out there, I didn't move. Luckily, he couldn't see me because the inside of my house was pitch dark. But to my absolute horror, he was headed straight for me. Not walking quickly or with purpose, just kind of casually shuffling toward the house. If someone else were to pass by, they would probably wouldn't realize what he was up to. He even glanced around a few times, as if making sure nobody else was watching. Inch by inch, he made his way into the yard. This guy was coming to get me. I was sure of it. I started to shake. I think it's worth mentioning that my dog is very people-oriented and usually goes bananas when he hears someone outside. This time, he was silent. He had no idea there was a man approaching, even though I was staring at him through the window. When the man was about halfway to the porch, my roommate's car finally rounded the bend and turned onto our street. As soon as those headlights lit him up, the man turned to look and recognized the approaching vehicle. My roommate and I both saw his face. He recognized that car. In his haste to get away, he nearly stepped in front of it and got run over. My roommate swerved into the driveway, scrambled out, and charged into the house. He didn't even speak to me. He just grabbed the axe out of our utility closet and went back outside to confront the man. But the man was gone. We called the police and the power company, and they both sent someone to check things out. The police didn't find anything. The repairmen reset the box on the pole near our house. A 
Apparently, the switch had been flipped, which is why our house, and only our house, was without electricity. I asked the repairman if there was any way that a person could have been responsible for that, but he didn't give me a straight answer. The following day, we went on a camping trip that lasted all weekend. If the man came back, we would never know. And after that, I refused to be home alone. If my roommate wasn't around when I got off work, I killed time at a local bar until he got back. We both moved away soon after. I never saw that man or that truck again, but sometimes I wonder how long he had been watching our house and what might have happened if my roommate hadn't been on his way home that night. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true stalker stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Nat Davies, Doba Khaleesi, Ada Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stonewolf, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes, for without you, I wouldn't have me or the channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please stay safe and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.